With the previous lecture, I've introduced to you the new equations that can be used for turbulent flow. They are given there on the projector, and I'm going to use it typically in a practical example. And this, this example is a typical problem that we will get in the air conditioning and refrigeration industry. We've got a duct 40 meters in length, and we've got air at a temperature of 10 degrees Celsius. So take note, it means that it has already been cooled, and typically that duct can be in a ceiling. And where the temperature is quite high, the temperature around the duct is 40 degrees Celsius, so it can be assumed at this stage that the wall temperature, the surface temperature, is 40 degrees Celsius everywhere. So the question is now, what is the outlet temperature going to be? And what will the heat transfer rate be from the hot air to that of from the hot air to the air conditioned air inside uh, the duct? <coughs> so I always recommend that you draw a graph of typically what this problem is all about. So if that is x, then that would be 40 meters. And we will have two temperatures. We will have the temperature of the wall, which in this case remains at 40 degrees Celsius. So the temperature of the surface is 40. Therefore, the temperature there will, of course, be 40, and the temperature there will also be 40. And our inlet temperature of the air is 10 degrees, okay, but we do not know what the outlet temperature is. Let's assume that is the outlet temperature to start with, and let's assume that the temperature is going to increase maybe linearly along that line. We know that is not true, but I specifically want to show you now the error that can be made. So that would be halfway through, and that would be the bulk temperature. And what is the bulk temperature? So, we, at this stage, we do not know what the outlet temperature is. Do you see that? So, therefore, we actually cannot determine a bulk temperature. So, you can guess anything you want. Some of you can guess and say, yes, I think the outlet temperature is going to be 40. It would not make sense to choose anything more than 40, to choose 50 or 60 or 100. Of course, the wall temperature is 40. That is the maximum that it can achieve. If you are very pessimistic, you can maybe choose 10. But does it matter? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose the outlet temperature to be 20 degrees Celsius. Okay. So therefore, my bulk temperature is 15 degrees Celsius. At 15 degrees Celsius, you can go and look in the textbook of single, then we can get the properties for air. Density is equal to 1.209 kilograms per cubic meters. Cp is equal to 1,004 joules per kilogram Kelvin. The thermal conductivity, K, is equal to 0.02476 watts per meter Kelvin. The Brundle number is equal to 0.7305. And the viscosity is equal to 1.802 multiplied by 10 to the minus 5 square meters per second.
Those are the properties. Yep, I have a question. Uh, this, is, um, this question means that uh, the other side is atmospheric pressure. Uh, the question says that we assume that the outside is atmospheric pressure. Yes, we assume that. Sorry? The outlet. The outlet. Yeah. Uh, yes, well, not really. It will, of course, depends on that pressure there. If there's not a pressure difference, there will not be a flow. So where it flows into at this stage doesn't matter. It might be another room uh, where they do some mixing, or it might be the outlet, you know, in terms of uh, where the air is being reject rejected. Uh, we don't know at this stage. But yes, there must be a pressure difference between the inlet and the outlet. Um, in terms of uh, air, if, we, if there's a pressure, remember that uh, <coughs> we determine the compressibility of any fluid by the Mach number. The Mach number is the velocity divided by the velocity of sound. And at room temperature, which would be very close to about 15 degrees Celsius, the velocity of sound is about 300 meters per second. So compressibility will only start playing an influence if the velocity in there is more than 100 meters per second. Otherwise, we can consider it as incompressible. Now, I promise you, if you've got a velocity inside an air-conditioned tube of 100 meters per second, everybody will run away. It's extremely noisy. Um, I think sort of a rule of thumb is that your velocities are typically less than 10 meters per second, order of magnitude, so it's very low. <coughs> okay. So we started by assuming an outlet temperature of 20, get a bulk temperature of 15, so that temperature there must then be equal to 15 degrees Celsius. <coughs> And let's just go and calculate a few areas because we know we are going to use it. And that is the cross-sectional area is 0.6 by 0.6. Then it is equal to 0.12 square meters. So it is 2 feet by 2 feet, approximately 600 by 600. The AS is equal to the perimeter multiplied by L, which is equal to uh, 0.6 multiplied by uh, 0.2. Mm, now, messing up now. Let's do it like this. It's 0.6. Uh, plus 0.6, plus 0.6, plus 0.6, uh, multiplied by um, 40, and the area for heat transfer is that's 64 square meters. The hydraulic diameter. Because we do not work with a circular tube, the hydraulic diameter is four times the cross-sectional area divided by the perimeter, the wetted perimeter. It's four times 0.12 divided by two times 0.6 plus 0.6, and that is 0.3 meters. Hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, my apologies. I've made an error somewhere. Uh, that is 600 millimeters, and that is 200. <coughs> oh, put two. Right. 
So the hydraulic diameter is 300 millimeters. The volume flow rate has been given, and that is equal to the velocity multiplied by the cross-sectional area. The volume flow rate has been given as 0.15 cubic meters per second. It's equal to the velocity. Cross-sectional area is 0.12. That would give us a velocity of 1.25 meters per second. A very typical velocity we will get in an air conditioning duct. Now that we've got the velocity, we can determine the mass flow rate. That would be the density multiplied by the volume flow rate. The density is equal to 1.209 multiplied by 0.15, and that is equal to 0.1814 kilograms per second. The Reynolds number we can write as rho v, the hydraulic diameter, divided by the viscosity. Take note, there's that other equation that we use a lot, four times the mass flow rate. We cannot use it in this case, why not? because that equation is only valid for a circular tube. Only valid for a circular tube. The density is equal to 1.209. The velocity is 1.25. The hydraulic diameter is 0.2, divided by 1.802, multiplied by 10 to the minus 5, and that gives us a Reynolds number of 25,167. Therefore, the flow is turbulent. Turbulent flow. If the flow is turbulent, firstly, it means that it takes just 10 times the hydraulic diameter before it is fully developed. So it is 10 times 0.3, it's 3 meters. Okay. So in terms of this duct, which is 40 meters in length, it will only take 3 meters before it is fully developed. And that's less than 10% in engineering. Nothing is... Uh, that's a, a, a small thing to ignore and therefore we can assume that the heat transfer coefficient is going to stay constant right through. Now the equations that we're going to use <coughs> um, is the ones for fully developed flow and I've given you yesterday the equations, there they are. I know it's very small, but if you look here somewhere, let me see if I can get it. Uh, yes, that equation there. Then you, that one there, there you see D divided by L. Then you can actually go and calculate the heat transfer coefficient in the developing part. But it is, we said that the developing part is small, and therefore we, assume, we can assume it, we can assume that it is negligible. There you go. So we're going to assume it is fully developed flow. Assume the flow is fully developed, and we are going to use the Meyer et al. equation and not the Glinsky one anymore, which gives the Nussel number is equal to 0.013, Reynolds to the 0.867, Pranel to a third. Meyer et al. 2019. 
So this is now what you will have to do right through this chapter and also in the example problems, also in the test and exam. Test and exam. This equation has an accuracy of 6%, or well, errors less than 6%. The second one there on the board has an accuracy or errors of less than 3%. But it takes much longer to do the calculations, so to save time we're going to use this equation. <coughs> so the Nusselt number is equal to 0.013. The Reynolds number is equal to 25167 to the 0.896. Prandtl is equal to 0.7305 to the third. And that will give us a Nusselt number of 76.56. number of 76.56. Now that we've got the Nusselt number, we can say the Nusselt number is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the hydraulic diameter divided by K is equal to the Nusselt number. We would like to get the heat transfer coefficient. The hydraulic diameter is 0.3 divided by the thermal conductivity, which is equal to 0.02. 467 is equal to the Nusselt number that we've calculated of 76.56. And the result from that is that we can calculate the heat transfer coefficient as 6.318 watts per square meter degree Celsius. Okay. Now let's go and calculate the heat transfer rate. The heat transfer rate is then equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface area. And now the thing that we're going to do, which we exactly shouldn't do, and that is to say, let's use a temperature difference of the surface minus the bulk temperature. So the heat transfer coefficient we've calculated as 6.318. The surface area is 64. Surface temperature 40 minus 15 as the bulk. The bulk is still a guessed value based on our choice of an outlet temperature of 20. And then the heat transfer rate is equal to 10,110 watt. That's not an engineering answer. 10.1 kilowatts. <coughs> and now that we know the heat transfer rate, we can calculate the heat transfer rate by saying it is equal to the mass flow rate Cp multiplied by the outlet temperature minus the inlet temperature. We've got the heat transfer rate, which is 10001. 10 double 1 0 is equal to the mass flow rate, 0.1814. Outlet temperature is what we want to determine. Inner temperature is 10. So it gives us an outlet temperature of 65.5 degrees Celsius. OK? Now the first thing, the first thing that I've said that we cannot do is exactly that. We've spent more than one lecture to show you that this temperature difference is not linear. The increase in temperature is not linear. So that's the first thing that you should have not done. But it's very easy to do calculations. Here's the outlet temperature of 65.5. Now just look at this problem, and I always want you to do it. So when you calculate something, ask yourself, is it possible? The inlet temperature is 10, the wall is 40. How can the outlet temperature be more than 40? It cannot. You agree? 
So that should also raise a red flag. Now, in many cases, it wouldn't. You would get a temperature less than 40. But what is very important is that this is not correct. Many of you are going to do exactly that in the tests and exams, and that's why I'm doing it. So let's do it the right way. And the right way is to remember that if we've got constant wall temperature, we have a temperature increase that's going to do something like that. And when we have that, then the heat transfer rate is being driven by the number of transfer units. In the last chapter on heat exchanges, this term is also going to appear a lot. And the number of heat transfer coefficient, heat transfer units, is the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface area divided by the mass flow rate Cp. In many cases in your textbook, this is not normally used in equations. But I want to ask you to get into, get into it. I'd rather use that because it tells you a lot. So the heat transfer coefficient is equal to 6.318. The surface area is 64. 0.1814. 1,004 for the CP, so the heat transfer units is equal to 2.22. What does it mean? It means that is a good value. You're going to get quite a significant increase in temperature. If it is 3, for all practical purposes, you'll already be very close to 40. And you should avoid using f three in any case, if you do design work. So 2.22 is a very good value. And then we can use this equation that we've derived, which says that the outlet temperature is the surface temperature minus the surface temperature minus the outlet temperature e to the minus n to use. In your textbook, it doesn't say n to use. It says minus the heat transfer coefficient, the surface area, mass flow rate, Cp. Now you can go and determine the outlet temperature as 40 minus 40 minus, oh sorry, that's the inner temperature, minus the inner temperature as 10, e to the minus 2.22. So this temperature should be the inner temperature, not the outlet temperature. And that gives us an outlet temperature of 36. 0.74 degrees Celsius. Thirty-six point seven is about thirty-seven degrees. It's this temperature. So you end up with a temperature difference there of only three degrees. How we should determine the heat transfer rate is with the L T D the lock mean temperature difference. Now look carefully. The lock mean temperature difference says this temperature difference, 40 minus 10, minus this temperature difference, 40 minus 36.74. Maybe I should change this to 36.7. So it is equal to 40 minus 10 is the temperature difference at the inlet. At the outlet, it is 40 minus 36.74. Those two divided by the limb of those two term, terms. Then 40 minus 10 divided by 40 minus 36.74. And that is 80.4 degrees Celsius. You all happy with that? I hope all of you are not happy with that. Okay. 
I've done that on purpose because this actually says the effective temperature between the wall and the air is 80 degrees Celsius. It cannot be more than about 30. You see that? It's very easy to make an error with your, with your computer. So always think about your answer. So it's not possible. It is equal to 12.04. In the inlet it is 30 and then it ends up with about 3. So it should be somewhere between 30 and 3. And now we can say the heat transfer rate is equal to the heat transfer coefficient, the surface area multiplied by the lock mean temperature difference, the LMTD. The heat transfer coefficient is equal to 6.318. The surface area is 64. And the LMTD is 12.04. And that would give us a heat transfer rate of 4,868 watts. It's not an engineering answer. It's 4.9 kilowatts. Again, very easy to do the calculations, but it is always very good to think about your answers. And many of you in the test of exam, you're going to produce something like this, and then you're going to go back and you're going to check if you've made something, if you did something wrong. But I would like to encourage you to always think about this, in many cases, a different way of checking it. And what you can do is look at now that you've got the outlet temperature, you've got the outlet temperature, you've got that temperature, you've got that temperature, you've got the mass flow rate and the CP, so you can always check the heat transfer rate by saying it is equal to the mass flow rate CP multiplied by the outlet temperature minus the inlet temperature. The mass flow rate is equal to 0.184, CP which is 1004, outlet temperature is 36.74, inlet temperature is 10, and fortunately it works out as 4939 watts, so it is also 4.9 kilowatts. So most probably, our calculation is correct. Are you happy with that? Yep. But the properties that you use is for Benedict. Aha, good. That's exactly what I want to go back to. So the properties, we have used the properties not at 20 degrees. We, set, we assume an outlet temperature of 20. And then we calculate that the bulk, which is 15. Now we can go and recalculate. So now we can recalc and says our next bulk temperature should be equal to 36.67 plus 10 divided by 2. We should get that value and then all the properties and recalc. Now, in the test or exam, you can just mention that to me. You don't have to go and do it, because we do not have enough time. But you will be surprising to see how accurate your first answer will already be. It will not be perfect, but it will really be very good. Okay. Any questions, ladies and gentlemen? Yes. Is there any case where the temperature on the inside will be higher uh, because of um, viscosity effects and the friction effects? 
The answer is no. If you go and look at thermodynamics, and I've done that myself a few years ago, and there is actually, as a matter of fact, an example that I've done on that, that takes that into consideration. But you will see from the thermodynamics, it will show you that it is totally negligible. So at this small Mach numbers, there's no increase in the temperature because of the friction on the wall. Really zero, far less than we can measure. Any other questions? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, then thank you very much, and then I'll see you again with one more period on this chapter. Thank you very much.